Welcome back to Data Driven Recruiting. My name is Sophia Beck, and I'm joined by my co-host Tigran Slayan. Hi, Tigran. Hey, Sophia. We're still doing this remotely. I'm getting very much used to it. But good, yeah. good. Getting into the groove. Well, today I wanted to talk about you know one section of the technical interview called whiteboarding. I think a lot of people who've moved their interview from physical one to virtual one. Uh, you know, mentioned the most difficult thing of a doing interview online is not having a whiteboarding session or not having a whiteboard. Mm -hmm. So I want to kind of uh, dig deeper into, well, first of all, what is whiteboarding session in technical interviewing? Why do we need it? And then kind of uh, like, yeah, how do you do it right on, online? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think there is a few things that people understand when they talk about whiteboarding boarding sessions and technical interviews, I think. One is just writing code on a whiteboard, which unfortunately still happens out there. So when you come mm -hmm. on a site and somebody asks you like a technical question, like a coding question, they expect you to get out there and write that code on a whiteboard. I've done it uh, on a Google interview when I was in yeah. Google, way back in the day. I think one of the most popular, like, you know, how does Google you know, do the interview, I think they show the whiteboarding and literally people need to write yep. code on the whiteboard. Yep. I mean, exactly. writing anything on the whiteboard is hard because now I cannot spell anything. <laughs> but I mean, it's not just spelling, right? Like uh, right. it's hard enough and uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's already a challenge, but especially when it comes to coding, if you've ever tried doing one of those like squiggly brackets, I don't know if you know what I'm talking mm. about. Some languages, it's yeah. a different pattern. I mean, try drawing that on a whiteboard and you realize how hard life can get. Yeah, that. and you have to have a good handwriting because even if you write it, if the mm -hmm. other person can like actually read it, then like, what's the point? But anyway, okay, so the whiteboarding, it can be done like they, they can ask you, hey, write the code. Here's right. the whiteboard, okay? Yeah, and then of course, there's like things like auto-completion and syntax highlighting, which people are very used to and that are mm -hmm. missing in a whiteboarding setting. But yes, so, so that's one thing. Uh, and then the second one is more around like system design interviews and problem solving where the questions are a little bit more high level. It's more about how would you build a system, structure a system, architect a system that uh, can scale, that can work in these circumstances. Those kinds of questions range from everything, starting from like how would you design like the Twitter feed so that it would scale and not break to like how would you make uh, new Uber with like tens of thousands of new rides or something like that. So, so that's for the listeners who might not be as you know technical. The system design uh, question you mentioned is more about kind of a uh, higher level. So it's more about okay, well, if you're an architect, how are you going to actually structure the building so that it lasts? And you can like maybe have like thirty story uh, floors. So it's it's more conceptual. You're saying. Yeah, um, and especially with sort of some of the larger companies and these types mm -hmm. of architectural interviews are expected even from more junior candidates because it's expected that you have at least some level of understanding of how things should work at scale because even if you might not right. be able to like design the entire architecture of the company, eventually you're supposed to make design decisions and you need to understand the trade-offs and things that work and things that don't. Right, so especially the scalability like because modern applications now are used by millions of people so yeah. it's not enough to be able to write a functional code it needs to function at a higher scale got it yeah exactly yeah. and that's why kind of like the somewhat larger companies put a heavier emphasis on it because they do mm -hmm. operate at a massive scale so hiring people who understand how to do things at scale is is a key component critical yeah <clears throat> so when it comes to the whiteboarding sessions i think the the first one, the write code on a whiteboard, you should just never do. Like like if anybody is still doing it, they're just committing a cardinal sin because <laughs> really it's a one, it's a terrible candidate experience and candidates are gonna walk out being frustrated. Two, you're just uh, risking, you know, potentially rejecting candidates that were actually great, but they haven't had the chance to practice writing code on a whiteboard. So they just failed the interview because they didn't yeah. have Yeah, and that's not a relevant skill. You, you never <laughs> write code on a whiteboard yeah. in a real job setting, right? Exactly, 
So just like bring bring an ID, bring a computer, or log into any of the online ID and just code there instead of just doing it on my board. So don't do that. If you're just yeah. gonna ask somebody to write a code, just write it on the proper setting. Right. Ideally, yeah. you're also not doing it on like you know somebody else's computer because you're not familiar with uh, somebody else's computer, which is another pattern mm -hmm. where hey, here is a computer, do that. Ideally, mm -hmm. you have an online collaborative coding. Uh, solution that you're using for interviews, like code signal interview, where you know you can be on your computer as an interviewer, the candidate can be on their computer, but just like Google Docs for coding, you can collaborate in a real IDE and ask questions. And that model, regardless if you're doing it in person like the old times or if you're doing it uh, remotely, that model works and that model scales. Now, when it comes to the second piece of it, I do think there is value in actually using a whiteboard because what you're doing in a high level interview is drawing diagrams and showing how different pieces would interact together. So we were literally, you're expected to draw things and that's kind of what whiteboards are meant for, to draw things. For more of a picture, yeah. So because <laughs> pictures say, you know, a thousand words, it's a lot easier to show this is connected to this drawing rather than trying to describe you know exactly. in words only okay yeah in words or text like how something like that would work uh okay. and in that case whiteboard interviews are really helpful and uh now that everything has transitioned online that's been actually one of the biggest questions we kept getting as a company that offers an interview solution is like can we get a whiteboarding solution in here and uh you know, I'm excited uh, about our upcoming launch of the whiteboarding solution. Yeah, that's exciting. So tell us a little bit more about how should one use the whiteboarding feature online in conducting, you know, more of a virtual interview. How can, you know, because, you know, probably many people are also not familiar with using whiteboard, you know, virtually. So what are some of the do's and don'ts? to ensure that you're conducting a very productive and efficient um, and great candidate experience in yeah. your interview. Yeah, so I guess when it comes to the, the whiteboarding piece, I think having the ability to sort of switch back from whiteboarding to coding is one of the components because eventually sort of just coming up with the high level design is not enough. You might have the need to actually write some code and show how that would work. Mm -hmm. uh, in reality, instead of just sort of stay, staying at the conceptual level. So keeping in mind that it's not just one or the other, it can be a combination of both is first. But the second one is just being more data-driven and structured about your, uh, even your system design interviews, because when you move on to system design, it's very high level, so it's really easy to lose the structure and come out of it without a clear understanding of how the candidate did, right? Because the goal of the interview is to have some sort of a scoring system that says, all right, this candidate performed at level X. And if right. you don't have clear criteria of what that looks like, especially on a something that's like a more of a high level interview, you can easily come out of the interview without just with your gut feeling of how the candidate did, which is very error prone. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. How, how would you analyze the performance of a candidate in a interview like system design interview where it's not it's not totally like can you write the code that runs without errors right. but it's more conceptual as well because it, it, it also is about you know how solid is the design right mm -hmm. like how scalable is this one how efficient mm -hmm. while and, and then how can this candidate make the trade-offs really well so what are some of the ways to make sure that you come out of the interview with a clear idea. You mentioned like kind of a score, so scorecard. Mm -hmm. How would you how would you structure that and how do you use that for people who've never never used the scorecard in their interview? Sure. Tell us a little bit more about yeah what it is and how to use it. Yeah, even when it comes to system design, I guess fortunately unlike something more like a visual design or UI design, there are uh, clear metrics that you should be looking for. Uh, mm -hmm. Even though I think what makes it difficult is that the question is not static, it usually evolves, right? Like I give you sort of a high level description, you start talking through how you would structure it, and then I add constraints or I add modifications or I 
slightly change the question while you're going like hey how would you what would you do if this came up what would you do mm. kind so, of build on top of what the candidate is uh, saying so it's a uh, it's not just like i have a set of a question i'm gonna ask but it kind of evolves with okay tell me more okay let's that you did this what are some of the issues how do you you know protect yourself from you know addressing those issues or security issues or whatever okay so yeah. okay so that's a little bit challenging. So how how do you how do you use the scorecard? What are some of the aspects you should evaluate? Yeah, there are some clear things that sort of that uh, you're trying to find from a system design interview is like, for example, memory considerations, right? Is this person considering that like you have a limited memory capacity and you should be careful with how much of that you're using and where you're storing some of the uh, data that you have? Are they taking into account network considerations that like some of the users of this product are going to have a low latency network and hmm. keep downloading everything into the computer of the user, it's eventually going to crush everything or have a very bad experience. Uh, so there is like certain things that go into the design. There is also the simplicity aspect of it because somebody else is going to be working on your design later on and needing to understand it all. So if you engineer something that's like very brilliant, but no one can understand it, that's yeah. one sort of aspect down. And different engineering teams value different things depending on the product, depending on what they believe to be the right measure. But the key is to have a clear write down of like, what am I trying to get at? Am I trying to measure their ability to mm. just handle things as they come at them that could be another one right like can this person be flexible and adjustable in their technical decisions as new information comes up but it's just all about writing those down uh, that's kind of what becomes your scorecard right like you have a list of attributes that you're trying to measure and as you ask your question as you go back to your list of attributes and say right have i managed to measure this ability have i not if i have i put a some sort of a score next to it. And then if I haven't, I'm going to keep asking questions to get at that attribute. So if I'm so, looking for flexibility, I keep mm -hmm. asking sort of, I keep changing the setup and seeing mm -hmm. how well you adjust. If I'm looking right. at the ability to uh, design something that's simple to understand, I keep asking your questions around like, well, uh, what if I'm a new developer who joined this team and is trying to understand your design? Like, how would I go about doing that? Do you think this is simple enough? And then I can go back to my scorecard and put a number next to it. This way, so, it is, you have a, you don't lose the structure because otherwise it's really easy to end up there. Yeah, just have a chat and then come out of an interview and then make a decision on did I like <laughs> did I like this guy did this yeah. or did I like this candidate did she impress me with her, you know her ability? But that's not what we're looking for, right? So so it sounds like it's important for the interview committee or hiring team to sit down and then write down what are some of the aspects that we're trying to evaluate for this specific job and what are what are the I guess not only just like the list of things but like how much we value specific ones because yeah as you said depending on the company if if we develop an app that's mostly used by uh, you know, people in the developing world and they don't have a, you know, high power smartphone, then you want to make sure, you know, your, your candidate's ability kind of coincide with what you're trying to build as a company. So yeah. kind of calibrating on what are important aspects and how important they are in kind of deciding on who, which candidate to go with and which candidate not to go with. Um, and then, and then also, specifying okay for each aspect this is the way we can delve into learning more about this person's skill uh, yeah. as you mentioned like if it's gonna be about um like giving more information and see how this candidate responds and so on so that everybody who's interviewing knows how to actually get that evaluate the specific aspect of or attributes that you're trying to measure Exactly. And the bottom line really mm. here is uh, to just generalize a little bit, right? Like the more high level your interview is, uh, the easier it is to fall back into uh, just gut feeling based decisions because 
you feel like you know you it's really hard to score it but it's the other way around like the more high level your input you get the more important it is for you to have a clear set of things that you're hoping to capture because otherwise again you're very likely to fall back into just making the wrong decision not even right. talking about the unfairness just making the wrong decision based on your your mood that day or something else yeah and that would have cost your team your company a lot of pain and money <laughs> right <laughs> yeah okay well thank you so much for your advice today and your inputs around how to create an effective whiteboarding interview session virtually um, for more tips and advice on data-driven recruiting you can visit ddr.codesignal.com we'll see you next time